Hi everybody, um, I'm here today with Mark Shotland and Ryan Fern Fernandez with Moab Paper, also uh, with Legion Paper. They'll explain a little bit about the relationship with uh, uh, the way that works in a minute. And we're going to have a short conversation today, hopefully one of a, a few more that we'd like to do, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, photographic papers. and. Um, how do you select a photographic paper? What's behind a paper? And, um, you know, what makes a paper different? So I'd like to kind of go right into it. And I think the first thing I'd like to do is, you know, talk a little bit about Moab papers. I've been using Moab papers for uh, quite some time. And um, it's always been a good paper to work with. Obviously, I also print with some other papers. Can't hide that. I certainly talk about it. But the Moab's always been one of my favorite. And uh, over the last year or so, Moab's released a number of new and different sur surfaces and uh, they're quite good, but uh, I've had a discussion with Mark in not too distant uh, past in regards to like what are the differences in the papers. I, mean, I don't quite understand what's a brightener, uh, what's meant by uh, all the terms that go into a paper. So Mark, I'm going to throw it in your lap, Ryan, yours too, um, in regards to you know, telling us a little bit about this and get us started. And let's let's kind of start like we don't know a lot of things, kind of the beginner side of things, because we know different papers and we can look at the papers when we go look at paper samples at the store, but we really don't know, you know, what we're looking at. You know, there's paper thickness, which is measured in what GSMs. Then they have mills, and then you've got uh, you know some of the, the the surfaces and brighteners and things like that. So maybe kind of, you know, going over some of the technical terms and what's involved in making a paper and coding a paper and doing that. Gentlemen? Okay. Uh, that's probably best to start about who we are and what our role is in this whole industry. So you mentioned Legion Paper and Moab Paper. Legion Paper is the uh, overall company, um, and Moab Paper is, represents the digital or the inkjet arm of our company. Uh, Legion Paper, we're the largest supplier, manufacturer, and distributor of fine art papers in the world. And um, we produce papers and supply papers into 17 different markets, digital just being one of them. And what that gives us is the capabilities and the flexibility to work in all these different markets and to choose new substrates and new coatings from one market and apply it to another. So that's, that gives us an advantage to innovate and to develop new products that we can bring into the photo industry that they have never seen before. Do you want to add anything? No, I think that's well said. I mean. That kind of speaks to who we are as a company and how we make papers. If you're starting at the beginning, how do you pick a paper? I mean, we always say sample box, right? So we just did the Photo Plus show and people come to the booth. Where do I start? I don't know paper. I just got a printer. Best way to dip your toe into the water, get a sample box, get all the papers we make. Because there's a lot of genres of paper. There's matte papers. There's photo papers. There's metallics now. Um, there's canvas. So... We say, get a sample box, we have two sheets of everything, print the same image on every, all those papers, and then look at it subjectively and say, all right, this is my work, and it's, it works best in these papers. This is the kind of photography I do. So I can't, you know, a lot of people will come to you and say, what, tell me a paper to use, and it's really a loaded question. You really have to explore the depths of papers that are available to you, not just ours, everybody's, and um, expand your horizons. So then you, that will help you find kind of the genres of paper you like. Or you might steer away from metallics. You might be more of a fine art matte person, 100% cotton. Uh, so we always say to test everything first because in, in the end, it's your opinion that counts, uh, not ours. And then the, there are many different aspects that go into making a paper. There's the thickness of the paper, the texture of the paper, the color of the paper, the brighteners, as you mentioned. So all these factors contribute to the overall end product that you receive in your hands. So what gives us that ability is that we're producing papers for drawing or printmakers that are outside of photography. And we can take those, those innovations and then produce our Moab range of papers. And a good example of that is our Slick Rock Silver. It's a product that we came out with about a year ago that uh, took uh, uh, something that was in the packaging industry. We uh, created our own coating and our own base paper and applied it to inkjet something that's never been done before. So that gives us that, that ability to bring some fun new products to the world of photography that, that uh, hadn't existed before. Yeah. Um, 
So you asked us to touch on some of the basics of paper, so it's yep. thickness, uh, which here we uh, measure in MIL, the millionth of an, inch, of an inch, which is also known as the caliper of a paper. So you have very thick papers and very thin papers. Moab papers are primarily on the heavier side, the fine art side. Um, there's some factors that that uh, that people that people associate with fine art, and thickness is one of them. Um, some of them are are text. Uh, some of them, sorry, are the uh, the weight of the paper, which we measure in GSM or grams per square meter. That's literally taking a square meter of paper, putting on a scale, and that weight in grams is is that final measurement. So if you see a 300 gram GSM paper. That means that that square meter of that uh, paper weighs 300 grams. Right. All right, now, so essentially, you really need to look at two things then, the thickness and the GSM. Yeah, because you can have a, uh, like a luster paper, 260 GSM could have a 10 mil, a uh, thickness of 10 mil. And you can have another 260 gram paper made out of cotton that would have a 22 mil, just because the cotton fibers are a little bit thicker, it's a little bit more lush. Right. And so that... So the, the grammage and the and the uh, caliper are two uh, uh, differentiating factors. For instance, our uh, slick rock silver and the intrada are both three hundred, or one of the intradas, two of them are three hundred GSM. The intradas could be thicker than the slick rock silver. The silver is much is a far more dense paper. So um, just in terms of caliper, uh, you're looking at intrada being a little bit thicker. But really, if you look at the GSM, they're equal. Okay. So it, it, I, I would say density or, or the GSM kind of plays more into the rigidity of a, of a paper. And then the caliper might be more of a, you know, printer setting issue or, um, you know, it, it'll tell you exactly how thick things are. Um, so the two sort of different things, but, but correlate. Let me, let me ask you a question. Of, um, somebody had put the question on the forum recently in regards to I forget exactly how they put it, but it's kind of like the half moon. It's like if you've got a piece of paper and you know, it's a big piece of paper, where that crinkle point is where you might get a crease if it just bends the wrong way. And somebody said that has a lot to do with the thickness of the paper in regards to, you know, uh, where it's not so flimsy that it begins to hold itself and have a rigidity. If you were looking at a really nice fine art, fine art paper, what would you suggest being, you know, a mill that you should look at? Like your intradas, what, what's the, the thickness of those? That's about a, uh, there's one that's a 15 mil, which is the 190 gram, and the 300 gram is right about 18, uh, 18 or 19 mil. Um, you know, it depends on what the artist is going to do with their print. For example, if the fine art papers, we're selling the tactile uh, uh, quality or characteristic of a paper, something you can hold and touch that feels beautiful. If you're framing it and you're putting it behind glass, you eliminate that ability for somebody to actually touch it. But what comes through that glass is the subtle texture, uh, not necessarily the weight, but the texture, the color of the paper, the uh, um, and and the overall just character, the the, the look of the paper. So if you're using it in a portfolio or if you're selling a print to somebody, then you're, you're going to take that, that weight into consideration, especially if you're leafing through that and you're, and you're feeling the paper. We, always, we talk to a lot of wedding photographers, and uh, they're always looking a way to upsell their work. A lot of them submit their images to a lab, they get it printed, they get it sent back, and it's a nice luster or a matte photo. But how do you upsell that? that person and one way to upsell it is through that luscious quality of, of holding a print that that has value to it and that's where the mill or the thickness and the and the uh, the overall texture of the paper comes into play and to that point when you're doing an album it really it depends on the album you're doing too if the pages need to fold and lay flatter you're gonna want a, a thinner paper um, if you really want that tactile tactile feel uh, our 300 gram also has a little more texture than our 190. You have more fiber there. Mm -hmm. So it does look slightly different than 190. So that might be the look you're going for, and you want a little more uh, hand to it or uh, rigidity. And then you go that one. But it's, there's no blanket statement to say which one to use, but there's recommend, recommendations we make uh, based on the application. A lot of times you hear the term you know, cotton and rag thrown out there. Exactly what does that mean in regards to all this too? Well, the cotton are not those puffy white flowers that you see growing in the field that we harvest and cut down and, and uh, you know, clear out uh, 
uh, acres of, of land to do. This is a reclaimed fiber from the textile industry. So it's actually one of the best in, uh, eco stories out there because it's not cutting down trees. Mm -hmm. It's reclaiming fiber from textile and from the shirts that we're all wearing. This falls under the floor. It's, it's, we're not taking the shirts and throwing them into a big machine and chopping them up. We do buy the, the cotton linters on, on the market. But it's something that's reclaimed. It's something that's, that we're not harvesting from, vir from uh, virgin uh, uh, cotton. Okay. So rag is, is an old term that refers back to the rags from the shirts in the textile industry. It's, and that's why it's synonymous with uh, cotton. And uh, so that's why you sometimes see those terms even in our names it's of our papers. It's a Somerset Museum rag or it's an Entrada rag. Um, so those are, that's kind of where it comes from, that term. Now, in the olden days with uh, black and white and color photography, it used to be a fiber-based paper and then a resin-coated paper came out. Uh, what are the differences in regards to those traditional papers that some people may remember uh, to what the papers are today that uh, you guys make? So there's a trend right now to mimic those papers that everybody remembers from the darkroom days, from the wet room days. Yep. And uh, there's two ways to do that. Through the resin coated, the RC based paper, which is uh, usually your gloss or your luster papers, which have been around for quite a while and, and, and it's taken for granted that most paper companies have those RC papers, which is just a, a kind of a plastic coating that gives you that E surface that we all loved when we, uh, when we yep. took our film to, to a lab and got the prints back. The, uh, what's really trendy right now is trying to mimic those fiber papers, those cotton fiber papers from the uh, darkroom days and using the chemical compositions to not only have that feel and look, but also the smell of, of those papers. And that's where we get the term Barita from. And um, we, uh, most manufacturers have Barita papers in their, in their uh, portfolio of products. And Barita is just the term of the chemical composition of barium sulfate. And it is something that allows a manufacturer to control the uh, the color or the, the the color of the paper without adding any optical brightness into it. It's it's some it's a way to to uh, produce paper with whether it be warm or cold. You can control that the color temperature of the paper, but without uh, really affecting the longevity by adding optical brightness to it. And these are the same chemical composition that was used in the in the wet room papers as well. And so we're applying those to these uh, digital papers. And uh, the one that we just launched is the Juniper Barata Rag. And it says 100% uh, cotton paper, just like the wet room papers. It uses a barium sulfate coating, just like the wet room papers. And it has a very nice heavy weight and feel to it. And also the smell. Uh, some people like it, some people don't, but it's a, it's a true true paper that um, will bring people back to when they're spending hours upon hours in the dark room. Oh, so now now we have another sense that we need to deal with in buying our papers. <laughs> and how well it's, it's a scratch and sniff. That's yeah. right. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, do me a well, favor. Uh, Let's go. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to speak to a couple of things. You know, we're starting in the basics of printing and papers and things like that. Mark had mentioned, uh, was talking about RAG and then talking about OBA. So for those who don't know what OBA is, optical brightening agent, um, it, it's basically something that makes it look brighter than it actually is optically to the eye. Um, there's a there's a debate on whether those how their capability of OBAs. Um, the theory is that over time those OBAs will fade and revert back to the natural state of the paper. So, Entrada comes Entrada bright, Entrada natural. Natural has no OBAs at all. Papers have been long enough around long enough to see those brighteners actually fade, but in theory, when they do, they should look exactly like Entrada natural uh, by the end of the fading process. So um, that that's essentially what OBA is, and and how it applies to our industry. And then you know, cotton. There's some we talked about cotton as a whole. What does that mean? Rag. Uh, but what does it mean in terms of using it in the genre of papers? Typically, you can get a nicer feel. Uh, to cotton papers than any other fiber out there. Uh, it's very soft, just as you would think of cotton. So for the tactile application, um, it's it's a very popular substrate to work with. Um, and, and it's also a little more, you know, if you're putting it into album, you're scoring it, you're, you're converting it somehow, it's uh, much more uh, usable in that form. Now, you, you have two surfaces. In, in typical printers, 
uh, especially for those that uh, aren't doing printing and are thinking about getting into it. Uh, many of the printers have both what they call a photo black and a matte black. How does that relate in regards to how the ink goes down on a paper? Um, or different papers have different ways to absorbing things, or is it the regard to how it lays on top of a coated, a coated paper? So. Yeah, in general terms, the photo black is used for the glossy and luster papers, and matte black is used for all the matte papers. So that's just two separate settings on your printer that you're going to select. And also, when you're using our profiles, and I'll talk about profiles in a minute, you need to select which uh, media type you're using so it can tell the printer which uh, ink set to use. Okay. If you're using uh, a matte base paper, it's going to absorb a, a more ink than a, a glossy or a luster paper, and therefore you want to be using the right settings, otherwise you're going to get some bronzing on there, you're going to get some results that you not necessarily want. So. This ties into ICC profiles, which I just mentioned earlier. So this, are, this is a, um, a piece of software that you download that uh, all manufacturers offer that allow your uh, printer and your computer to communicate to the paper. So it lays down the right amount of inks and using the right media setting, whether it's a lust or a gloss, based upon that specific machine. Uh, the reason why you want this is because you want to best mimic what is appearing on your screen that appears on your paper. So you're not wasting paper, you're not wasting ink. The only way to properly do this is to run in a fully calibrated environment. So that means investing in the tools necessary to calibrate your monitor, to calibrate your printer, to calibrate your scanner. All your devices, all your tools need to be calibrated so they all talk to one another because what would appear on your screen otherwise would not appear on print. The ICC profile is that uh, piece that, that that bridge, that communication between all those devices that allow you that what we've tested in our environment on a fully calibrated environment, uh, we're, we, we're telling the printers through the software exactly how much ink to put down on our papers. Okay. Now this is what's called a CAN profile or a generic profile, something that we do in our environment on your printer. It's not necessarily exactly your environment because your printer is in a different humidity setting, it's in a different uh, environment, but this gives you the best uh, starting possibility. The best type of profile is something that you would have you generate yourself, or you have somebody create specifically for your workflow. Yeah, we're we're going to be uh, doing a lot in regards to that. Uh, both probably, you know, specifically right now we've had discussions with uh, you know Spider in regards to the nice kit they sell, which allows you not only to calibrate your monitor but to generate um, test targets and calibrate and and profile your papers. So. Uh, we'll get into more of that on the side, but it, uh, I have found in my use with your profiles that you know they're pretty much you know dead on in regards to producing something that you got to be ninety five percent close. I mean, it's these days I've watched people actually make their own uh, profiles that I didn't think printed as well as profiles that are made and, and sent by the manufacturer. Um, and there's also something we'll cover more in a separate uh, video elsewhere is that you know there's the rips that come out like image print uh, by Colorbyte and you know the profiles they make that are really nice and they actually not only calibrate uh, you know by the type of paper but by the light viewing that uh, the paper will probably be in when it's is put in like is it going to be under tungsten or daylight and so forth so there's a lot of variables to to, to look at there um, in regards to paper one of the things that you mentioned and a lot of people might not be familiar with is what's called bronzing. So maybe you could kind of define uh, bronzing. It used to be a lot more prevalent, but we don't see it that much anymore. Um, how would you describe that in regards, to, and, and how come it seems to have improved or basically gone away? Bronzing is essentially, it, it's more noticeable on gloss and luster papers, yep. primarily because uh, the inks that were used um, laid down too much, uh, whether it's too much of the black or too much of a certain color. Um, not necessarily always associated with a profile being used. Um, it's just also the, the, the innovations of the machine and the types of inks that are being laid down. So a bronzing almost literally means what, a, what it sounds like, is that you look at a print, you, it put it, you angle it a little bit, to it, and yeah. it kind of has a sheen to it that's not part of your print. It, it, it looks a little brownish and it just kind of, it, it's a little bit uh, annoying. And so you saw a lot of this in the early days, you know, the 2000P printers with the pigment inks, which are large particles that would 
lay down on your on your print, and then as the technology improved, it started to disappear. This issue, um, you know, with the new printers that are out now, the P eight hundred and the Pro one thousand, they they with twelve ink sets, or I can't remember how many of them. It really reduces that effect um, because not only has our technology to produce better profiles uh, come about, but also their ability to lay down the right amount of ink and smaller ink particles and and innovations over time. Yeah, but it's also called new timerization, right? Yep. Well, that's something a little bit different. Yeah, that's yeah. something uh, that, uh, yeah. that... Well, that, that's almost a bronzing, but it's, it is different. Maybe we should talk about that because that, that obviously somebody's going to ask that question. So. <laughs> now I brought it up. Now you brought it up. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just... Uh, how you're... If you bring a print in a indoor setting, and you take that print to uh, to UV light or next to a window, the colors will shift. Right, and so that's that's basically what it is. And again, improvements over time. There are problems in the early generations of Epson uh, machines, uh, but ink technologies has pretty much eliminated a lot of that that issue. I haven't seen either problem in a long time. No, no. I, I, I've uh. seen it once in a while, very very seldom, especially on more glossier papers. And of course, that, you really kind of have to have a nice flat lighting that you're you're tilting the print to, and then, you know, so it's not something you see an awful lot of. Outgassing. You hear an awful lot about outgassing, and there's an awful big debate whether uh, print needs to uh, lie out in the open um, for an hour or sometimes for a day. So first off, if you folks don't mind, explain what the term outgassing means, and specifically. Uh, you know, at least with your papers and probably others, you know, what are we looking at for a period of time that a print should be outgassed before it's either packaged, wrapped, or framed, and so forth? Yeah, outgassing is, is essentially that's an invisible gas that uh, is emitted from the inks after a short period of time uh, having been laid onto your print. Um, what it's not really specific to any type of paper it's just specific to the inks themselves and how this is important to, to an artist is that they want to let that print breathe they want to let the gases from those uh, from the inks uh, dissipate before you put it behind glass because if you frame it too early and these inks start to uh, release their gases um, it'll start to fog up your frame or the glass of your frame so there's general rules of thumb about uh, outgassing. Some people leave their prints out for a week before they frame it. Some people just do it overnight. It's predominantly thought just to leave it 24 hours before you actually do any any um, framing. Um, that seems to be the general rule of thumb in, in that sense. In outgassing, you probably shouldn't stack your prints. They should be face up, uh, yeah. separated, and you know just put on a big table or somewhere. Yeah. yeah, even more applicable for us now because we're doing a lot of face mounted um, papers or papers being utilized for face mounting. That you you want to let those breathe, otherwise, you're going to cause bubbles when you go to face mount uh, if you don't. Well, now that you bring that word up, face mount, there's a lot oh. of a lot of debate uh, about you know how well face mounting works, and you know um, some manufacturers are saying that the you know, warranties are void if you do face mounting um, specifically because you're adding the adhesive now directly to the paper surface and then uh, usually an acrylic um, uh, substrate that you know they get mounted to and all those things obviously contribute to changing the the nature of the the picture and uh, specifically how it affects the the inks on the top of it what, what any experience there uh, not that I really want to recommend face mounting but if you bring it up, and once again, we're going to see it show yeah, up yeah. on the forum about what, what goes on. So anything you can share there would be helpful. For sure. I mean, it, with any sort of conservative process, or, um, you know, whether it be mat board or, or face mounting or acrylics, whatever you're using, your end piece is only as good as the material as you use. So if you use a low end, um, basically face mounting, there's three components. There's the paper, at least when we do it, uh, the paper, a clear film, and the acrylic. All right, so if you use a, a lower end film or acrylic, there's the there's the risk of e even getting bubbling and gassing out from the acrylic, or uh, it uh, lessening the archivability of the print. But same goes with matte board. If you use a cheaper matte board, something with acid in it, uh, that could happen as well. So face mounting, there's archival ways to face mount, and we know many people who do it for a living. Um, and there's 
there are several manufacturers that make both the films and the archival acrylics that those things are going to last far far past anything else out there um we made specifically for what we've done we we got into face mounting and we don't do any face mounting but in that industry uh our papers are being applied a lot more for metal paint. so our, our slick rock silver which is the only metal paper of its kind uh was aimed to attack that direct on metal look and that's what all the labs are doing they're you know big labs with literally a rigid piece of aluminum and they're dye sub uh sublimation printing on it uh our process is literally better and more archival in every single way it's printing with pigment inks on a silver sheet using an archival film and acrylic to then face mount that so it, it's not only a better resolution a better print uh you have more flexibility in terms of the size you can do but it's more archival than the other one so i wouldn't i wouldn't shy anybody away from um metal printing or face mounting or things like well silver printing on the slick rock just for uh, longevity sake excellent well maybe what we can do is um you can provide me with a couple sources and we'll put them in the article that accompanies this video for uh, anybody that's interested in learning you know who's doing the face mounting that works well with your your paper source and yeah. your surfaces and so forth well let's go back to your your silver rock paper for a second and then um because it has the word silver in it, many people may um, take the term that it's a metallic paper. And there is a difference between metallic and silver rock. Is that correct? Well, there's, there's our slick rock, slick rock genre of metallic papers. Okay. Uh, we first had the pearl. And so when mo many people think about metallic uh, or pearl, they think that white base with sort of a metallic uh, undertone kind of a twinkly kind of thing right exactly yeah. looking at it the right light is metallic looking at another it looks like a luster or a right. gloss or something like that so it, it's very muddled um when we say slick rock, the reason we call we designate it slick rock pearl and slick rock silver is that our silver is actually metal um with a technology on top of it that it's microporous rinse and dry it's the first of its kind like that but it is actually metal which is why it can be sold as a metal print. Anybody looking to get into that but industry? It's metal on paper. Uh, yes. I mean, it's laminated as a backer to give it some okay. rigidity. But the real, the real crux of the of the line is the the metal with the technology that's on top to allow it to be run through an, uh, Canon, Epson, and any aqueous printer. Right. So um, yes, that one. The pearl is an RC paper, um, and the uh, the metal. Or the silver is, a, is an actual metal paper. Okay, and it's got a silver look to it. Yeah, I mean, it looks like you take it out of the box, it looks like a sheet of aluminum. It, well, yeah, like gray aluminum or silver right, right. aluminum, yeah. Well, you, you know, it, it has two different looks. You know, now we, we were talking about face mounting. When you look at it raw, it looks like a, a very, like a raw piece of metal, very industrial kind of look. If you look at it, if you want a more modern look, you face mount it and it becomes this high gloss piece of aluminum. So it, it's pretty versatile. I do want to come back and uh, visit with you guys again in regards to, you know, actually pulling some papers out and looking at them and talking about, you know, maybe some of the manufacturing processes that go into it and so forth. But in regards to the introduction, we've covered, you know, the matte, the glossy. Well, we really haven't talked much about the glossy, but there is a super glossy, which we used to call, and I guess in the traditional surface, F surface. And uh, you offer that too, correct? We do. Yeah, we offer that. It's, it's not uh, the growing part of our, our papers. It's mostly the matte and cottons and the baryta and the silver that are that are uh, growing. But we do offer a gloss, a high gloss paper. Okay. So, you know, there are some people that still would like that for commercial purposes somewhat, I guess. But mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that that's there. So anyway, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, specifically, uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, doing this with us. This is one of our first uh, Skype interviews, um, and it looks good. I just can't, I'm sure it'll come out much better on the video, but uh, I wish I could be there. And I actually do hope, uh, as uh, time goes on, uh, you know, that we can meet somewhere and you know have a discussion over prints. You're always yeah. welcome to visit me in Indianapolis and visit the gallery. We got plenty of room to throw paper prints around on big tables and. Uh, you know, look at some things and have more discussions. But um, I want to emphasize, you know, not only to you, to you folks, but also our readers that, 
you know, it's still the print. You know, we've had lots of discussions, specifically at Photokina, with a number of uh, different people. Even had an extended conversation with Henry Wilhelm in regards to the permanence of prints and, you know, what gets left behind. And um, it's been said a number of times, you know, when you die, your legacy is not what's on the hard drive, but what's in the print drawer. And uh, you, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about making sure that, you know, we're making more prints and getting a chance to enjoy what photography always was about and that was that tactile feel holding a nice piece of paper in your hand looking at an image on a wall you know but the bottom line of being able to hold it or see it you know rather than have to view it you know through uh, some sort of uh, computer process ipads computers or whatnot yeah. so i um, appreciate your time and you know this is where we're going so put your thinking caps on and hopefully next time we visit we can uh, talk a lot more about uh, some of these things in, in particular. Great. Right. Guys, I want to thank you. First thank off, you, right, once right. again, thank and, you, Kevin, um, Kevin. for all our readers and everything, once again, uh, appreciate your time, and uh, we'll see you guys on the Luminous Landscape.